Before you listen, if you enjoy the stories and want to hear more, then please consider subscribing. Most of you listening aren't subscribed, so please take this time to subscribe. Turn on notifications so you'll never miss a story and be the first to hear. You'll also be supporting me. Thank you. I owned a small construction business and was looking to buy a used truck to haul some of my equipment around. Rather than going to a dealership, I browsed Craigslist since I was hoping to save some money finding a deal on an older model. I came across a listing for a 1995 Ford truck for only $1,200. The pictures made it look decently maintained with just some minor wear, so I contacted the seller, who called himself John Smith. Over email, John told me the truck ran great with no issues, but he was selling it so cheap because he was suddenly moving out of state in a hurry. This seemed like an ideal bargain for me, so we arranged to meet that Saturday around noon at an address he gave which happened to be at an isolated warehouse on the outskirts of town. In hindsight, this sketchy meeting location should have been my first red flag something was amiss. When I pulled up to the abandoned warehouse, John was already waiting eagerly next to the truck and waved me over with a big smile. The truck looked just as it did in the photos, with some dents and scratches, but otherwise seemingly solid. John even offered enthusiastically to let me take it for a short test drive, since we were on a quiet side street with no traffic. At first everything seemed totally normal as I took it slowly around a few blocks, listening for any odd sounds from the engine or transmission. The vehicle drove smooth and handled well on the road. Completely disarmed by the test drive, I pulled back up satisfied and grabbed my wallet from my pocket to pay John, thinking I had lucked into a steal. As I unzipped my wallet and pulled out the wad of $100 bills I had withdrawn from the bank earlier, I heard the chilling metallic click of a shotgun cocking. My blood instantly ran cold and I looked up to see John now pointing a sawed-off shotgun barrel straight at my chest, his friendly face replaced with sinister glaring eyes. I froze in terror. Panicked thoughts racing through my mind as I stared down the gaving shotgun muzzle aimed point blank. My heart felt like it was pounding out of my chest as I sat there paralyzed, hands trembling around the cash I had extended to John. Moving in slow motion, I started to plead for my life, willing to hand over every cent if he would just let me go unharmed. But John forcefully snatched the money, and in that brief moment while he was glancing down to thumb through the bills, some primal survival instinct made me react. Without conscious thought, I slammed my foot down hard on the accelerator, tires squealing and smoking in protest as the truck lurched forward. Just as we jolted into motion, John looked up and fired off a deafening blast from the shotgun, the pellets barely missing me as they blew out the truck's back window in a spray of glass shards. Adrenaline pumping through my veins, I didn't dare look back, frantically swerving the old truck through dusty side streets. My only clear thought was getting distance between us as fast as possible. Up ahead, I could see John speeding off in a black SUV and I pushed the old truck to its limits, terrified he'd be back to finish me off. My hands gripped the wheel white-knuckled, still shaking uncontrollably in terror and adrenaline from my narrowly escaped execution. My hands were still trembling in terror and adrenaline as I finally pulled over and stopped when I felt safely far away. I could hardly breathe but managed to call the cops with shaking fingers to report what had happened. The police came quickly to take my statement, but said with the associate's fake name they had little to go on right now to find him. I could only provide a vague description of John and the vehicle he drove off in. Over the next few weeks, paranoia started to set in. I became jumpy any time a car drove near me or parked on my block, flinching if strangers approached too close. When walking to my car, I found myself constantly scanning the shadows, gripped by the fear that John might reappear and finish what he started. I berated myself for letting my guard down that day and not seeing the clear warning signs it was a trap, but the police reassured me these setups can fool even the savviest person when money is dangled before them. Still, I was left constantly looking over my shoulder, simmering with anger that this criminal was still at large somewhere. Part of me wanted to hunt him down myself and make him pay, but I knew that temptation came from pride and vengeance, not rational thought. The healthiest option was letting the police do their job and accepting I might never get closure. But that was far easier said than done. I became hyper-vigilant to the point of paranoia. My mind replayed the chilling sight of that shotgun barrel aimed point-blank at me, 
feeling grateful to be alive, but so violated. In the end, I decided to invest in dash cams and tracker for any future vehicle purchases. Lesson learned. I also learned to meet only in very public spots and bring some with me for safety. As much as we want to think the best of strangers, there are dangerous predators out there looking to take advantage of trust. I had learned my lesson the hard way, but tried to find purpose in it. While I lost some money, the situation could have been far worse if I hadn't reacted fast in that split second when I saw the opening. My business struggled for a while without that truck, but staying alive and unharmed was what truly mattered. I have been struggling to find decent work for months. My savings were dwindling and the pressure was on to pay my bills. Out of desperation, I turned to browsing Craigslist for any local jobs. I came across a listing that looked promising. A delivery driver needed for a distribution company paying $25 per hour. The job description was vague, simply saying they needed someone with their own car for same-day deliveries. But the pay seemed too good to pass up, so I responded to the ad right away. The employer emailed back quickly, saying I seemed like a good fit and they urgently needed someone. They told me to come by the warehouse address listed that afternoon to get started. Already this was seeming a bit odd and rushed, but the promise of making quick cash clouded my judgment. I convinced myself it was just a new startup company needing drivers last minute. So I drove out to the sketchy warehouse district on the outskirts of town that day, hoping this could be temporary work to get me through. When I arrived at the graffiti-covered warehouse, I was surprised to find a rolling door shut and no other cars around. I had just reached for my phone to call the number listed in the ad when the metal door screeched open. A scruffy-looking man in jeans and leather jacket emerged and introduced himself as my supervisor, Dave. He led me inside to a mostly empty warehouse with just a few beat-up chairs and a metal desk. After cursory introductions, Dave handed me a sealed cardboard box and an address written on a slip of paper. He told me this was a trial run to deliver the package to that location in the next town over. Seemed easy enough, though I was puzzled why they hadn't done a proper interview or onboarding. Still, I was absolutely thrilled at the prospect of making such quick and easy money. Despite the oddness so far, I eagerly told Dave I'd be back with a completed delivery to the address he provided in 45 minutes max. I picked up the taped cardboard box and loaded it onto the back seat of my car then punched the destination into my GPS and headed off, my gas tank nearly empty. As I started driving out of the city, I couldn't stop thinking and worrying about making rent this month. I cranked up the radio to drown out my racing thoughts, gripping the wheel tightly with nervous anticipation. About 20 minutes into the trip down a lonely rural highway, I hit a large pothole that caused the heavy box to suddenly topple over in the back seat with a loud thud. Concerned the impact may have damaged its contents, I glanced back to check on it. My eyes went wide with alarm when I noticed the force of the fall had busted open one bottom corner of the box. Inside, I could clearly see numerous tightly wrapped bricks of some kind of powdery white crystalline substance. My heart instantly dropped into my stomach when I realized this so-called delivery company was very likely a front for transporting illicit substances and I was unknowingly acting as a mule, illegally couriering this narcotic contraband to its destination. I panicked, gripping the wheel until my knuckles turned white. I knew I should turn around immediately, but was too afraid of blowing my cover and the consequences I might face from the criminal organization behind this. I convinced myself that maybe I was mistaken about the contents. Against my better judgment, I resolved to complete the discreet drop-off as instructed to avoid rousing any suspicion. My hands were shaking and slick with cold sweat as I turned onto the final street. I delivered the box to the specified address, an ominous house at the end of a long driveway. I spit off as soon as the transaction was complete, checking my mirrors repeatedly to ensure I wasn't being followed. My mind raced anxiously the entire way back, both terrified of the dangerous criminals I had idiotically gotten myself involved with and paranoid of police catching me red-handed with a trunk full of narcotics. As soon as I returned to the sketchy warehouse, I immediately told Dave I quit effective immediately, no notice. I feared he may threaten me into silence, but he just shrugged and said I seemed too fragile for this line of work anyway. After that, I vetted Craigslist job posts much more thoroughly, making sure to meet any potential employer in person before agreeing to actual work. Times may get tough, 
but jumping opportunities without asking questions first could have dangerous consequences. While simply delivering one box seemed harmless on the surface, I'm grateful I followed my instincts to get away from that illicit operation immediately. Out of desperation, we can find ourselves considering things we would normally never dream of doing. This chilling experience was a wake-up call to always put ethics and safety first, regardless of circumstances. While the money may seem appealing, nothing is worth compromising one's morals or freedom. I'm just thankful I escaped that close call unscathed and wiser. It serves as a warning that some opportunities come with a darker reality lurking beneath the surface. A right guy's sell in because I've got a story that will send shivers down your spine. It all began when my husband, Mike, and I embarked on a mission to find budget-friendly furniture on Craigslist. We were hunting for the perfect armchair, something cozy to nestle into with a good book. Little did we know that this pursuit of comfort would lead us deep into a nightmarish labyrinth. We stumbled upon a listing that appeared too good to be true. It was a remarkable antique armchair, advertised at an unbelievably low price. The seller, who went by the name I Sell Stuff 100, claimed that it was a cherished family heirloom that needed a new home. What struck us as peculiar was the lack of pictures of the chair in the listing. Yet we attributed this to the possibility that the seller might not be very tech savvy. We decided to contact I Sell Stuff 100, and to our surprise, they responded swiftly. The seller suggested that we could pick up the chair later that evening at an address conveniently located just a short drive away. With excitement and a touch of skepticism, we decided to make an adventure out of it and headed over to see the chair for ourselves. Upon arriving at the provided address, we were confronted with a sight that sent a shiver down our spines. The house, which looked like it had seen better days, stood before us in a state of decay. The paint was peeling and the yard was overgrown, creating an ominous atmosphere. We exchanged worry glances but ultimately decided to proceed, holding on to the hope that the chair would prove to be the incredible find we had initially imagined. As we reached the front door, it creaked open slowly, revealing a frail elderly man with a hunched back. He introduced himself as Mr. McAllister, his voice trembling slightly. With a sense of unease, we followed him inside, where dimly lit corridors led us to a room filled with an eerie stillness. There, in the middle of the room, stood the chair, shrouded in a dusty sheet. It felt as though the chair had been waiting for us, and despite the unsettling surroundings, an inexplicable urge drew us closer to it. Mr. McAllister began to share the chair's history with us. He explained that it had been a treasured heirloom in his family for generations, and he was looking for a loving home to pass it on to. While his eagerness to part with it raised our suspicions, the chair itself appeared to be in excellent condition. Its intricate design and old-world charm were undeniable, and we decided to take a calculated risk. We handed over the cash to Mr. McAllister, and with his frail assistance, we carefully loaded the chair into the bed of our pickup truck. It was unexpectedly heavy, but our anticipation of cozy nights ahead gave us the strength to persevere. After thanking Mr. McAllister, we set off on our journey back home, the chair now a mysterious addition to our lives. That evening we placed the chair in the corner of our bedroom, convinced that we had struck gold with our find. Against the pale lavender walls, it exuded a quaint and charming aura. We imagined ourselves lounging comfortably, blissfully unaware of the haunting nightmare that would soon descend upon us. However, that very night, as my head rested on the pillow, a chilling nightmare consumed me. In this horrifying dream, I was paralyzed, trapped in a world of darkness, unable to move or scream. And there, within the dimly lit room of my dream, sat an elderly man, his face grotesquely devoid of a mouth. His unrelenting gaze bore into mine, and an overwhelming malevolence washed over me. I woke abruptly, drenched in cold sweat, gasping for breath. To my astonishment, Mike was awake as well, his eyes wide with fear. Without uttering a single word we both knew, we had experienced the same nightmarish vision. We tried to attribute it to the stress of the day and the unsettling environment in which we had acquired the chair, desperately hoping it was merely a one-time occurrence. But it wasn't. Night after night, the same haunting nightmare tormented us. The old man with his ghastly, mouthless visage would occupy the chair, his malevolent eyes fixated on us. Each time, we'd wake up trembling, 
our bodies drenched in perspiration, recounting the nightmare to each other with an escalating sense of dread. Our once happy home became tainted with an oppressive atmosphere. The chair, once a symbol of comfort, had transformed into a cursed relic of a malevolent presence that cast a shadow over our lives. We began to avoid entering our bedroom, fearing the horrors that awaited us each night. As the relentless nightmares persisted, our relationship became strained and our mental well-being deteriorated. Desperate to liberate ourselves from this relentless torment, we made a fateful decision to rid ourselves of the accursed chair. Its presence had become too unbearable. Regrettably, we found ourselves unable to contact Mr. McAllister, and to our shock, the Craigslist listing had mysteriously banished, as though it had never existed. With no other recourse, we resolved to donate the chair to a local thrift shop, praying that its new owner would be spared the anguish we had endured. Once more, we loaded the chair into the bed of our pickup truck. As we drove away from our house, a profound sense of relief washed over us. The thrift shop welcomed our donation with open arms, and as we left the cursed chair behind, we hoped that its malevolent influence would cease to haunt us. Strangely enough, from that night forward, the nightmares came to an abrupt halt. So, here I am, sharing our harrowing ordeal with all of you. Whether it was the chair itself or something far more sinister, I cannot say for certain. But one thing is undeniable. The Craigslist chair we thought was an incredible bargain became a nightmarish entity that still lingers in the dark corners of our memory. Remember, dear readers, not everything you find on Craigslist is what it appears to be. Sometimes the allure of a bargain can lead you down a path lined with nightmares and horrors you never could have imagined. Sleep well, my friends, and be cautious of those dusty, antique chairs that may carry secrets darker than you can imagine. I was living in this cozy two-bedroom flat in a quiet neighborhood. Rent was getting a bit steep, and I thought, why not find a roommate? So I put up an ad on Craigslist, nothing fancy, just the basics. The rent, the location, house rules, and a bit about myself, I'm a tad obsessive about cleanliness. After sifting through a mountain of responses, I eventually settled on someone who seemed like the real deal, Mia. In her mid-twenties, gainfully employed and new to the city, she checked all the right boxes. We exchanged a handful of emails, had a brief chat over the phone, and she came across as friendly, easygoing, you know, the kind of roommate you'd hope for. Fast forward to moving day, and Mia arrived with a few bags of her belongings. We chatted about our interests, how we envisioned decorating the place, and it all felt pretty standard. Those initial days together were refreshingly uneventful, and I genuinely thought my Craigslist roommate venture was off to a smooth start. But life's never just sunshine and rainbows, is it? On the very first night that Mia spent in our apartment, things took a turn for the downright bizarre. We're talking about three in the morning bizarre. I was rudely jolted awake by these eerie noises drifting in from the living room. My first sleepy thought was maybe Mia had left the TV on or was having a bout of insomnia. Still half asleep, I dragged myself out of bed to investigate. Lo and behold, there sat Mia in the dimly lit living room, her expression utterly vacant. She was muttering incoherent words, her voice so hushed it made my skin crawl. It was as though she was having a conversation with someone or something that I couldn't see. Her eyes had this unsettling glint, reflecting the faint glow of the streetlight sneaking through the curtains. My heart was doing a drum solo in my chest by this point. I mustered up the courage to ask her what was going on, but the moment I spoke, her eyes snapped toward me, and she fell completely silent. I tried again, this time more firmly, but she blinked at me as if emerging from a trance, her face a canvas of pure confusion. I couldn't shake off that bone-chilling feeling of unease. but. I decided to give her the benefit of the doubt, thinking maybe she was sleepwalking or having some bizarre dream. I desperately hoped it was just a one-time thing. Spoiler alert, it wasn't. The same spine-tingling routine played out night after night. At exactly 3 a.m. like clockwork, Maya would creep into the living room, the mumblings growing louder and more unsettling with each passing night. I dreaded that hour, and the sleepless nights turned me into a bona fide nervous wreck. I couldn't take it anymore. So one morning, I finally gathered the courage to confront her about it. I asked if she had any recollection of her late night escapades, but she looked genuinely bewildered. She claimed she had no memory, rushing off as a bizarre dream or some sort of sleepwalking. I wanted to believe her, but there was something in her eyes when I mentioned the mumbling. 
It was like she was wrestling with something she couldn't grasp or didn't want to acknowledge. As days turned into weeks, I became a sleep-deprived mess. I noticed other strange behaviors during the day. Mia would often zone out, her gaze fixed on nothing for long stretches. Her once friendly demeanor grew distant and conversations with her felt strained. I tried convincing myself that there was a logical explanation. Maybe she had a sleep disorder or was under extreme stress, but deep down I couldn't shake the feeling that something more sinister was lurking beneath the surface. Now here's the twist, I didn't suddenly turn into an amateur detective, searching for clues about the apartment's history or hunting down creepy connections. No, I was too wrapped up in my own eerie experiences to bother with that stuff. One evening, it felt like the walls of our apartment were closing in on me. I couldn't take it any longer. The sleepless nights, the bizarre mumblings, and the unsettling feeling that something dark was lurking just beyond my understanding had pushed me to my breaking point. With a heavy heart and a lump in my throat, I decided it was time for one last confrontation. I couldn't keep ignoring the bizarre occurrences that had become a nightly ritual. I needed answers, closure, anything to put my restless mind at ease. I made the most difficult decision of my life. I asked Mia to leave. It wasn't an easy conversation to have, and her compliance without resistance only added to the eerie atmosphere that had taken hold our once harmonious living space. As she gathered her belongings and walked out of our apartment for the last time, a strange mix of relief and trepidation washed over me. I hoped with every fiber of my being that her departure would finally bring an end to the unsettling occurrences that had plagued our nights. But here's the chilling epilogue to my Craigslist roommate horror story. I still don't have all the answers. Was Mia truly innocent, a victim caught in the clutches of some unexplained force? Or was she concealing a dark secret even from herself? The enigma of those nights will forever haunt me, a constant reminder that sometimes the most inexplicable terrors can unfold right under your own roof. As a broke college kid, dropping my ancient hunk of junk laptop meant desperately stalking Craigslist freebie listings to snag some hand-me-down replacement preventing classwork crisis. So when I spotted a week old post offering up a dusty but gently used MacBook Pro for only $60, I felt safe spotting such miracle bargain. Without over contemplating sketch details potentially explaining the crazy discount, I messaged eagerly to claim my graduation lifeline. Meeting at the nearby park, no red flag stood out interacting with a middle aged seller named Gavin clad in forgettable jeans and baseball hat barely glancing up. His mumbled story blaming an ex for leaving a laptop behind getting quickly muted by excitement flashing cash to fund my poor grad student dreams again. Who cared why practically free tech deals materialized past midnight rendezvous exchanges with nameless goodwill givers. Safely home, I plugged in anxious to confirm functional magic promising at least a few smooth working semesters ahead before software outpaced my bargain's data capabilities. But as the startup screen illuminated stiff plastic edges now weathered soft, I noticed an external drive icon held surveillance footage in my Explorer sidebar. Odd name, I thought absently clicking through folders revealing hundreds of active desktop screenshots plus videos time stamped in precise five minute intervals going back three entire years. I've opened the earliest dated files expecting maybe some honey I shrunk the kids reference or quirky art project explaining the medieval imagery slowly populating my screen until human forms sharpened into focus within each scene. A distinct blonde woman emerged in disconcertingly vivid detail moving about utterly mundane domestic tasks. Washing dishes, working at her desk, yoga poses in front of broad shadowed windows all depicted from an intimate insider angle like a ghostly spectator inventoried her every routine. I slammed the laptop shut heart suddenly racing to slam dunk deductions. This was covertly confiscated property, being relentlessly surveilled. Not some generic lost and found electronics those unnerving files indicated. Fear surged wondering if I had unwittingly inherited holy grail blackmail detailing horrors planned for this unsuspecting woman now documented fanatically courtesy of some unstable voyeur I enabled access to. Equally plausible my seller himself was behind the rivetingly private imagery I continued violating simply witnessing. What if I was patient zero infection set to spread his gnarly mental pathogen wider once pursuits of new obsessions outpaced squirreling artifacts of past conquests? Panic rising as freefall reality set in, 
I began combing dozens more revealed folders littered across the creepy virtual truth. Alongside Jug counterparts, I now noticed doc files containing thousands of timestamped word pages. Gulping anxiously, morbid fascination drew me towards opening the earliest document dated precisely the same month stills began three years prior, and their meticulously transcribed read. My new downstairs neighbor moved in five weeks ago, and I cannot stop compulsively tracking her every move. The realization hit me like a ton of bricks, my mind racing with the implications of what I had stumbled upon. My initial curiosity about the contents of the second-hand laptop I had innocently purchased was now replaced with a cold dread. It was one thing to find forgotten files, quite another to discover what appeared to be evidence of someone's life being monitored without their knowledge. I sat there for a moment, the laptop now a sinister presence on my desk. My heart was pounding, my thoughts a whirlwind of fear and confusion. Reluctantly, I opened the laptop again, my hands almost trembling. The files were organized meticulously by date, each one named with a precision that suggested obsession. As I clicked through the files, the scenes unfolding on my screen were alarmingly intimate. The blonde woman, completely unaware, went about her daily life. The camera angles were unsettling, some from a high vantage point, others seemingly from a closer, more personal level. It was as though the person behind the camera was constantly shifting, finding new ways to observe her. In one video, she was reading a book in her living room, the camera angle suggesting it was filmed from a higher shelf. In another, she was in her kitchen, the camera positioned in a way that it captured her face in perfect detail as she cooked. The voyeur had captured her in moments of laughter, deep concentration, and even in moments of sadness. It was as though they were trying to document every facet of her emotional state. As I delved deeper into the files, a chilling narrative began to form. There were notes attached to some of the videos, comments on her routines, guesses about her thoughts and feelings. It was as if the person behind the camera was trying to piece together her life, understand her, or worse, to predict her next move. Hand clasped tightly over mouth, I recoiled in horror, skimming dozens more diary entries cataloging the narrator called Gavin and his inexplicably intense fixation with modestly pretty Hannah two floors below him. His preschool teacher hours should never even cross this phantom woman's college student routines by all logic. Yet yeah, I read on nauseously following his descent into disturbed addiction fueled by watching her window, kissing passwords to access her social media, plotting meat cutes to arrange fateful public interactions, even speculating in gruesome medical precision how he might sample literal flavors once winning her as his forever living doll through whatever means necessary to ensure their predestined souls bonded eternally. By the time I reached his finale entry fantasizing graphic murder-suicide victory scenarios freeing our perfect love from moral laws, I nearly vomited onto the ominous epic detailing years methodically plotting to overtake then consume this innocent lady's every life force like his personal sustenance supplied, should she ever deny their whispered metaphysical connection. Snapping instantly sober escaping the virtual house of psychotic revelations, I proceeded to factory wipe all traces of Gammon's warped gift for my world and memory both for Hannah's continued safety. Then manically, I recreated new online personas posing as random former Craigslist customers warning about the predatory seller in hopes shielding wider targets. But the chilling coast files and even more chilling living creature generating them still haunt peripheries my dare glimpse what darkness surely still stalks society unseen until provoked by obsession's perfect storm. My ancient, lumpy, twin-sized hand-me-down mattress had finally reached the point of causing unbearable back pain and restless, interrupted sleep every single night. But as a nearly broke college student, an expensive brand new queen mattress was out of the question given my extremely limited budget. In an act of desperation, I turned to trusty Craigslist, hoping to find a used queen mattress in decent condition for under $100. After scrolling through pages of ads, one post caught my eye from a guy named Ron who claimed to flip mattresses and beds on the side for extra cash. The photos in Ron's ad showed mattresses practically stacked floor to ceiling in what appeared to be a claustrophobic storage locker. Ron boasted in his posting that thanks to high inventory turnover from his side business, he always had an abundance of lightly used mattresses at unbeatable wholesale prices. 
One particular queen-size pillow top mattress caught my eye at just $75. The pictures showed it carefully wrapped in thick plastic, which Ron said in his ad preserved it from any dirt, stains, or funky odors. He claimed it was only slept on for a few months by the previous owner who upgraded to a bigger king-size mattress. Even though I felt skeptical about someone getting rid of a nearly brand new pillow top mattress so quickly, the price seemed too good to pass up. I messaged Ron through the ad and arranged to meet up that weekend to check out the mattress in person before committing to buy. That Saturday, I met Ron at the Baron storage locker as planned. He pulled up in an overcrowded pickup truck and came off immediately as an overly friendly, fast-talking salesman type clearly eager to make a deal. After briefly greeting me, Ron quickly launched into his well-rehearsed pitch about the stellar qualities of the mattress in question, emphasizing how it was practically brand new and that the pillow top provided extra plush comfort. As anticipated, when Ron led me to the back corner of the locker, the mattress was still carefully wrapped in thick plastic. He helped me cut it open and thoroughly inspect the mattress, pointing out its impeccable condition and trying to assure me this was an unbeatable bargain that wouldn't last long. Although I still wondered why someone would get rid of a plush pillow top mattress after only a few months, nothing seemed visibly wrong with it even after my thorough examination. And the discounted price was far better than I could find anywhere else or afford brand new. After contemplating, I agreed to hand over $75 in cash to Ron, who then helped me load the extremely heavy and unwieldy mattress into the back of my small sedan. After struggling to maneuver it up the stairs, I finally got the mattress situated on my rickety hand-me-down bed frame in my apartment. Cutting open the remaining plastic wrap, the fabric cover seemed pristine and had that characteristic fresh new mattress smell rather than any musty odor. Eagerly, I put on a mattress protector followed by fresh sheets and collapsed onto the plush pillow top surface, instantly noticing the improved comfort and support for my aching back. I fell asleep excited at the prospect of finally getting a restful night's sleep. However, around 3 a.m. I got abruptly woken up by a strange crinkling sound coming from beneath me whenever I rolled over. I sat up, turned on the bedside light, and felt around trying to pinpoint the location. There was a noticeable lump on the lower edge near the foot of the mattress. I got up and flipped the mattress over to inspect the odd bulge. Firmly pressing along the base fabric, I kept hearing that unmistakable crinkling sound of what seemed like paper. Highly curious now, I rushed to the kitchen for a sharp knife and carefully slit open the fabric underside of the mattress. To my utter shock, concealed inside was a bulky package containing over $10,000 in cash stacked and banded together. My sleepy brain raced to make sense of why there would be a large sum of money purposefully hidden within an otherwise normal used mattress I randomly purchased off Craigslist from some guy. Perhaps the previous owner concealed their life savings inside to keep it safe from a spouse, roommate, or creditors. Or maybe it was illicit cash derived from drugs, gambling, or other criminal dealings that was stashed away. Regardless, they had clearly intended the mattress itself to serve as a clever hiding spot for their secret cash ward. After the initial shock finally subsided, I admit my thoughts soon drifted to contemplating what I could do with this totally unexpected and fortuitous financial windfall that had miraculously fallen into my lap. That substantial amount of cash could help me pay off nagging credit card debt from school and my remaining oppressive balance of student loans so much faster. Plus, I could use the extra money to finally get some much-needed repairs done on my unreliable beater car that had been giving me problems. While the mysterious and potentially questionable origins of the money did hid weigh on my conscience at first, it almost felt like divine providence that I had discovered this hidden treasure. I ultimately rationalized that the right thing to do was put the unexpected cash gift to good use pragmatically improving my precarious financial situation. I carefully rehid the money in a secure spot in my apartment while researching the safest way to gradually integrate these newfound funds into my accounts without raising any suspicions. Over several months, I slowly paid off my most burdensome debts and upgraded my decrepit junker car that had been costing me money in repairs. When curious friends and family asked about my markedly improved financial state lately, I vaguely cited getting a long overdue promotion at work combined with a small inheritance check from a distant relative I barely knew. I felt guilty lying to those closest to me, but it seemed harmless enough in my mind given the circumstances. In the end, no one ever came searching for the hidden cash hoard or accused me of any wrongdoing. For all I know, the previous mattress owner either genuinely forgot about their secret savings stash over time, 
or perhaps met some untimely tragic demise, taking the truth to their grave. Let me tell you about this one time I tried to sell my old laptop on Craigslist. It was one of those situations where I was in a rush to upgrade to the latest model, so I figured I'd make a quick buck selling the old one. I posted a pretty good deal, snapped some pics, and before long I had a buyer. Some guy named Dave. Dave was quick to reply, and he said he'd swing by my place to pick up the laptop. Looking back, I should have suggested meeting somewhere public, but I didn't think about it at the time. It was just a laptop, right? No big deal. So the day came around when Dave was supposed to come and pick up the laptop. I remember it was a typical summer day, bright and hot, the kind of weather that made everything seem normal and safe. I was home alone, just finishing up some work when the doorbell rang. I got up, stretched, and went to the door. It was Dave. From the moment I laid eyes on Dave, something fell off. He was dressed in a dirty t-shirt and ragged jeans. His hair was unkempt, and he had this twitchy sort of energy that made you feel uneasy. He had these dark, beady eyes that darted around constantly, like he was always on the lookout for something. I invited him in, trying to keep the transaction as brief as possible. We sat down in the living room, the laptop on the coffee table between us. He didn't even glance at it. Instead, his gaze kept sliding past me to the rest of the house. It felt invasive, like he was trying to memorize every detail. I brushed it off, thinking maybe I was being paranoid. But then his gaze landed on a family picture on the wall. It was me, my wife, and our dog, a happy snapshot of a family outing. He pointed at the picture, and a smirk crawled onto his face. It made my skin crawl. Still, I tried to keep things professional. I showed him the laptop, booting it up to show it worked fine. All the while, Dave's eyes kept wandering, his unsettling laugh breaking the silence every now and then. After the demonstration, he quickly handed over the cash, like he was in a rush to get it over with. But once the laptop was in his hands, he didn't leave. He continued to sit there on my couch, looking way too comfortable. He looked around the living room and then back at me, that creepy grin never leaving his face. That's when my wife came home. I could see his attention shift, and the way he looked at her was outright disrespectful. The hair on the back of my neck stood up, a sense of unease settling in my gut. I knew then that I had to get this guy out of my house, away from my family. Telling Dave to leave wasn't easy. He seemed to enjoy pushing my buttons, taunting me with his words, his laughter echoing in the room. It was only when I threatened to call the cops that he finally got up and left, but not before leaving us with a chilling warning. He left behind an air of menace, a feeling of disturbance that took a long time to fade away. Looking back, that was just the beginning of the nightmare that followed. A couple of days after the laptop exchange, I started finding strange letters in my mailbox. No return address, just my name scrawled on the front in messy handwriting. Inside, there'd be these weird rambling messages full of threats and ramblings. I had a hunch that it was Dave, but I had no proof. The threats started a few days after Dave left our house. At first, it was just a single envelope in the mailbox. No return address, no postage, just my name scribbled on the front in the shaky, erratic handwriting. Inside was the single sheet of paper, filled with this bizarre, rambling message. It was full of these odd phrases like, you're gonna pay, and watch your back. It made my blood run cold, but at the same time, it was so outlandish that a part of me thought it was some twisted joke. But then more letters started coming. They showed up every few days, always the same, no return address, no postage, just my name on the front and these disturbing messages inside. The threats started getting more explicit and more personal. Dave started mentioning things only someone who'd been inside my house would know. One letter would describe what my wife was wearing on a particular day, another would mention our dog by name, and one even referenced a private conversation I had with my wife in our backyard. That was when it hit me that the threats weren't just empty words. Whoever was behind them was watching us. I started taking precautions. I installed security cameras around the house, changed the locks, and even got a new security system. But the letters kept coming, and with each one, the threats escalated, the words becoming more violent, more malicious. There was one letter that still haunts me to this day. It was more detailed and more specific than the others. It detailed what would happen to me, to my wife, even to our dog. The description was so graphic, so violent, it made me physically ill. I remember staring at that letter. 
feeling this chilling sense of fear creep over me. It was clear that this wasn't just about the laptop anymore. It was personal. I got in touch with a buddy of mine who knew a thing or two about cybersecurity. I still had Dave's email from the Craigslist interaction. My buddy worked his magic, and we managed to trace the IP address. Turned out Dave was living just a couple of neighborhoods away. I took all the evidence to the police, and this time they were able to act. A couple of days later, Dave was arrested. The letter stopped, and life slowly got back to normal. So, it was just your average day, and I was sitting in my little apartment. The sun was just beginning to rise, casting an orange hue on the worn-out walls of my room. I was checking out Craigslist, hoping to find a decent bike. You see, I had this new job, and it was a bit too far to walk, but not far enough to drive. A bike seemed like the perfect solution. There it was, a listing that caught my eye, a used but decent-looking mountain bike that was well within my budget. The seller lived across town, not exactly a neighborhood I'd visit often, but hey, a bargain's a bargain, right? I shot off a quick message to the seller, and within an hour, we agreed to meet later in the day. As I arrived at the address, I noticed that the area was more run down than I'd expected, but I brushed it off. I was there for the bike, not the scenery. There was a guy standing near an old bike that matched the Craigslist photos. He was larger than I'd imagined, with a scruffy beard and a look that made my gut squirm a bit. He motioned towards the bike without saying much. I gave it a quick once-over, deciding to wrap up the deal quickly and get out of there. Just as I extended my hand to pull out my wallet, I was brought to a jarring halt by an unexpected sensation. A firm hand suddenly gripped my arm with a strength that seemed to squeeze the blood out of my veins. Whirling around, I came face to face with another man who had appeared seemingly out of nowhere. His face was hidden behind a crude mask, a terrifying counterpoint to the friendly encounter I had anticipated. What I could see of his eyes glinted with a dark, malevolent intent that sent a bone-chilling shiver down my spine. The unsettling realization dawned on me slowly, like a horror movie twist unfolding in real time. This was a setup. A sinking feeling of dread washed over me, an icy tsunami threatening to pull me under. This wasn't a simple transaction anymore. It was a meticulously orchestrated trap, set for the sole purpose of robbing unsuspecting victims. That weren't here to sell a bike at all. They were here for easy prey. They were here to rob me. The rapid drumming of my heart echoed in my ears, a relentless soundtrack to the fear that coursed through my veins like a wild river. Despite the paralyzing terror, my body responded with primal instinct that dated back to our ancestors' fight-or-flight responses to danger. Ignoring the screaming protest from my muscles, I summoned all the strength I had and tore my arm away from the man's iron grip. With the instincts of a cornered animal, I bolted. Not a second thought, not a backwards glance, I just ran. The world around me became a blur, the details lost in my sole focus on escape. I was running on raw adrenaline, the potent hormone that our bodies produce in response to high-stress situations, enhancing performance and reaction times. The men's surprised curses became the wind at my back, growing fainter and fainter as I put considerable distance between us. Even in this dire situation, I realized that the element of surprise had played to my advantage. My quick and unexpected reaction had caught them off guard, buying me crucial seconds to escape. It highlighted the importance of always being alert and prepared for unexpected situations, no matter how safe they may appear. Once I was far enough, I whipped out my phone and dialed the cops, my fingers trembling as I recounted the incident. I gave them the address describing the men as best as I could, but deep down I had a sinking feeling they wouldn't really follow up. Maybe it was my own cynicism, or perhaps it was the dismissive tone of the operator on the other end. After the call, I took the long way home, navigating through bustling streets and crowded alleys, constantly looking over my shoulder. The sense of relief that washed over me as I finally stepped into the familiar surroundings of my apartment was indescribable. But even in the safety of my home, the incident continued to haunt me. I found myself jumping at the slightest noise, paranoia clinging to me like a second skin. I couldn't ignore the fear, the feeling of having escaped a dangerous situation. I kept replaying the event in my head, wondering if I could have avoided it, done something differently. Thanks for listening in. If you like these stories and want to hear more, then please subscribe and like and support this new channel. We have more stories for you to listen to.